I can go on social media and project my views, which means that you can find someone who agrees with you on any given issue, regardless of what you believe. And so that affirmation and that tendency of motivated reasoning, which is a cognitive bias that means that we search out information that agrees with us and that uh, confirms what we already believe, that makes us feel good. Those, those things together uh, result in a situation in which it's easy for me to find something that makes me feel like I'm right and then I cling to that. Hi, everyone, and welcome to Politics of Pandemics in the Global Era. We are so excited to share this survey course for everyone with you and to um, continue Suffolk's historic mission of engagement with the community. And we're able to do that through our partnership with the Ford Hall Forum, which is generously funded by the Lowell Institute and absolutely with the support of WGBH. So the course is designed as an introduction to look at a very, very complex phenomenon, the COVID-19 pandemic, which is a seminal event, the impact of which we have yet really to determine. We're, we're living through it right now. And every week we're coming at you with a different angle. Today, we're looking at the importance of good information which is unfortunately often drowned out by either misinformation or malinformation. So I'm gonna, without any further ado, turn it over to an amazing panel. Take it over, Shoshana. Thank you for having me. Uh, when I think about the many challenges we all face during the current uh, COVID-19 crisis, making sense of the enormous amount of information we get daily is probably on top of the list. As it turns out, we not only have to deal with the coronavirus, but also with what has been termed the virus of disinformation. We are bombarded nonstop by varying and often contradicting information, adding to the state of confusion, distrust, and distrust in social and political institutions. Today, we are going to discuss information warfare, and more specifically, how the information we consume, including mis- and disinformation, plays a powerful role in framing the different issues relating to COVID-19. We are going to ask our panelists where and how people get their information. Can we differentiate between accurate reporting and conspiracy theories? And how does the information we consume shape our behavior and affirm our identities? We will also explore some ideas about how, ways to remedy the crisis and work together to better not only the health of our bodies, but also the health of our democracy. Our panelists this afternoon include Jennifer Cavanaugh, a senior political scientist with the RAND Corporation and co-author of Truth Decay, Jonas Kaiser, an affiliate at the Berkman Klein Center at Harvard, and soon to be my colleague at the Communication and Journalism Department here at Suffolk, and award-winning veteran journalist Felice Fryer, who covers healthcare for the Boston Globe. Thank you all for joining us. I want to start with you, Jennifer, and the interesting data uh, you have uncovered with the research project titled Truth Decay. Can you start by defining the concept? What do you mean by truth decay and how does it manifest in the context of COVID-19? Because it, it looks to me like a textbook example. Textbook example. So truth decay is the term that we use at RAND to refer to the diminishing role that facts, data, and analysis increasingly play in our political and civil discourse and in our policymaking process. And I think we have a graphic that we can show you that talks a little bit about both the definition and then the system that we describe as truth decay. So the definition that I'm going to provide here is in the center, truth decay's four trends. So the first trend is an increasing disagreement about facts and data. So here we're talking about divergences between the data that we have and what people believe. An example would be uh, beliefs about the safety of vaccines. We have an increasing amount of information that tells us that vaccines are safe, and yet an increasing number of people who believe that they're not safe. So it's not just that there are vaccine skeptics, there have always been vaccine skeptics, it's this increase in the dis distrust of vaccines as we get more and more data showing us that they are um, safe. 
And we have a number of different examples there, both in the health um, uh, sphere, as well as in areas like immigration, um, crime, and a whole host of other issues where we see this divergence. And I believe the relating second, to, oh, sorry, relating to no, vaccine, just now they said about 30% of people say that they will not get vaccinated. Right. right. So the vaccine issue is a hugely important one in this context. Um, and the second and third trend I think here, you can also talk about in the context of vaccines, they go along together. The blurring of the line between fact and opinion and the increasing relative volume of opinion compared to facts. Mm -hmm. And you can see this um, on social media, you can see it on cable news, anywhere where fact and opinion and fiction are presented in a way that's interchangeable. It makes it really difficult for a viewer or a reader to determine what's true and what's not true. And we see this surrounding COVID as well. We see lots of different um, experts, um, people who consider themselves to be as informed as um, epidemiologists who have no background, providing their opinions or their takes or their interpretations of data. And we have that right alongside someone like Dr. Fauci, who we know is an expert. Mm -hmm. And then finally, declining trust in key institutions that used to be looked to as sources of reliable information. So you can think about government agencies like the CDC, um, as well as the media. Um, just trust in the media is also down. So what you end up with is a situation in which people aren't sure what's true and what's not, and they don't know who to turn to to get the accurate information. The other pieces of this figure just define the rest of the system. So you see the drivers, that's what we think of as the causes. Um, cognitive processing, cognitive biases, just the way we process information makes us susceptible to disinformation. Of course, changes in the information system, the media landscape, the internet plays a big role. Competing demands on the education system, the way that we're trained and taught to distinguish between facts and fiction um, and facts and falsehood, um, that training hasn't necessarily caught up with the types of information we're presented with, creating a gap and a susceptibility. And then polarization uh, between uh, political parties, between social groups, economic groups, that makes alternative narratives um, really powerful and makes them thrive easily. And then the bottom captures the consequences. And we focus here on consequences in the policy speaking, speaking sphere, as well as in the political arena. Thank you. So we'll get to the consequences a little later, but I wanted to, to um, stop on, on one of the issues related, because I, I know that you looked at the news consumption habits of adults. And what trends, because it's really interesting, where do people get their information? And so why do they think what they think. And what I'm interested in, so what kind of trends have you uncovered and how does these habits of consumption connected to the rapid decline in uh, trust in public institutions? Right, so we see that, first of all, most people use many different sources of information. So people aren't relying totally on one. And I think that's important to keep in mind. I think when we think about what are the most popular forms of news, typically the one that's most popular and also most trusted is often broadcast television news. Um, that's the way that a lot of people get their news. Um, but we see big demographic differences in where people turn for news. So young people are much more likely to rely on internet journalism. So um, things like Politico, um, as well as on social media. And older, uh, older news consumers are more likely to rely on print um, and broadcast journalism. What we find in our research is that these different types of media are really very different. They're providing very different types of information. It's presented the same information, but with a different tone and a different style that has, can have a very different effect or a, present a very different um, overall picture of an issue to a set of readers. And so I think that's why understanding these differences in how people consume news is important because someone who's getting a story in, in print journalism and someone who's reading the same story online are getting very different types of information. Yeah, and the, the Washington Post published an article just yesterday um, exactly uh, verifying this finding and, and showing the correlation between people who got the, most of their stories from print and broadcast seem to have a more accurate information of what's going on. Uh, but I know that one of the um, data that you find is that about third, you said, uh, recognize that they use unreliable sources but continue to use them, that was a little surprising to me because it's one thing to believe it, but yet another to, to recognize that it's a not a reliable source, but to continue to come back to that for information. Yeah, it was surprising to me and my colleagues as well. Um, and you're exactly right. We found that about a third of news consumers um, knew that the news sources they used were less reliable than others or reported that they were and yet continued to use them. So what does that mean? I think there's a couple of different possible 
um, interpretations. The first is that people actually aren't looking for factual information when they're reading the news. They see it as a form of entertainment. So they don't necessarily care. They're not making their choices based on what they think is most reliable. They're making their choices on what's the most interesting. The other is that news consumption is really like a habit, a lifestyle habit. So I may read news on social media because it's easy for me to scroll on the subway or easy for me to read while I'm in the car waiting for my kid to come out of school. And, and so I make choices based on what fits in my lifestyle, not necessarily what's most reliable. But either way, we see that readers, are make, readers, viewers, they're making decisions based on things that aren't just the reliability of information. And that's important to know from a research perspective, as well as from a journalist perspective. So another issue that I'm interested in that's related to trust is when you think about this trust from a historical perspective, uh, I think that some of it is justified, especially, for example, in the African-American community. Uh, and I don't think it's a coincidence that the, the social protests that we see about structural racism and police, uh, police brutality erupted in this way right now. And I'll, I'll just uh, quote something that Representative uh, Ayanna Presley said recently to the Associated Press, uh, and I quote, uh, we are right to be paranoid and to ask tough questions. History uh, has shown us when we do not, the consequences are grave and in fact, life and death. How can we gain back trust in communities where it feels there is a reason for the distrust, a justified reason? Yeah, that's a really good question. It's a really hard question. I think the first thing to recognize is that rebuilding trust takes a long time. I think we can all know that from just our personal relationships. When somebody violates your trust, it takes a long time before you maybe trust them again. Um, the second is I think that we need to understand the sources of that distrust. So what is it specifically about the institution that is causing that distrust? Is it the individuals inside the institution? Is it the process? Is it the outcomes? Is it a specific event or the way we're communicating? Because there's many reasons why someone might distrust an institution. And in order to rebuild trust, it has to be kind of like a personalized response that builds and addresses the specific issues that the community has with that institution. And I think part of it is, is it will be a bottom-up response. We know that trust in local institutions tends to be higher than trust in federal institutions, whether it's newspapers or government or me trusting my doctor but not doctors writ large. The reason is that those things are close to me and I understand them. And so a piece of rebuilding trust is starting from the bottom up, thinking about community-based journalism and then scaling that up over time, thinking about how we build some of the institutions or the personalization of local government and mm -hmm. scale that up to state and federal government as well. So we'll get back to that because I think there's more to be said about that when we'll talk about consequences. So um, final question before I bring Jonas into the conversation, you had said that a um, couple of the trends that you, um, you present in the model, you've seen in other um, time in history, but what's really kind of unique to, is the current, for us right now, is the current level of disagreement about objective facts. Uh, and, and so I, I want to ask, I mean, I mean, because it, it is new and even as a journalism professor, I'm not sure what to tell my, my students how, how to think about it because now we're arguing about if it's raining or not. Uh, if, you know, all of a sudden face masks have become this politicized, uh, should we use it, should we not use it? So are social media platforms the main culprit? How did we get here? I mean, I think social media plays a role, but I think we can think about the role the broader internet plays. I mean, when, when I can Google any piece of information that I want, when I can go on WebMD and feel like I know as much as my doctor, then I may be more likely to, um, to question um, what I'm hearing from experts and to disagree because I found some contradictory information or I've made up my own mind. Uh, another piece of this is the fact that because there is now such a diversity of sources, we just have more sources of information than, um, than, than we used to. And we also have more democratization of that new space. Anybody can be a source. I can go on social media and project my views, which means that you can find someone who agrees with you on any given issue, regardless of what you believe. And so that affirmation and that tendency of motivated reasoning, which is a cognitive bias that means that we search out information that agrees with us and that uh, confirms what we already believe, that makes us feel good. Those, those things together uh, result in a situation in which it's easy for me to find something that makes me feel like I'm right. And then I cling to that um, and, 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 and willing to cling to that, that emotional response over 
um, objective facts and data, which doesn't have the same emotional resonance for me. Yeah, so we'll come back to this issue um, um, a little later on. Uh, Jonas, I want to bring you into the conversation now, uh, and I want to get jump right into um, this point of um, social media, but uh, just a quick step backwards, if we can start with um, you defining the differences between, how do you define the differences between misinformation and disinformation? Because I know that sometimes it's used interchangeably. Sure, the general idea when we talk about misinformation or disinformation is general, or the distinction is based on intent, meaning that misinformation is generally used for the spreading or, or creation of falsehoods without the intent of actually writing something that is wrong, whereas disinformation is usually used in the context of deliberately spreading and or creating uh, falsities to, to kind of like, yeah, uh, confuse people, to uh, lead people astray and similar things. And I think it's a political system. Um, so um, you looked at a host of issues regarding um, health communication. You looked at climate change anti-vaxxers, Zika virus, now you're looking at the far right. Um, so considering um, your, your extensive background here, uh, how do you characterize the particular vulnerability of science reporting to misinformation? That's, that's a great question and, and a, a complicated one. In, in general, science communication is always hard as we all kind of like know from academia, that is kind of like we have to break down complicated findings that are really you know, as clear as we want them to for uh, the public so that, you know, like they can do something with these informations. And kind of like we already kind of like as academics usually are not great at doing that. We are, however, at the same time confronted with journalism, which kind of like operates into, you know, like making or avoiding uncertainty at any given point. And this already kind of like is, is in contrast to kind of like a science where it's all about nuances, right? right? And so in this context, we already have, you know, like some, some points that are up for contention. At the same time, of course, we are embedded in a bigger discourse, meaning that, uh, for example, in the US, you kind of like have a discourse that also contributed to the undermining of uh, intellectualism of science of basically questioning science for example if you think about climate change communication but also if you think about uh, vaccination discourse and basically questioning experts and what they say um, to kind of like push a different agenda and the current coronavirus pandemic falls into the similar patterns basically on these kind of like vectors that were already there and kind of like the talking points that we already knew and the actors that we already know now basically have a new topic that can they can push forward. Yeah, I saw yesterday in the Senate, I don't know if you guys watched it, uh, uh, Anthony Fauci, Dr. Fauci testifying, and he just, at this point, he looked so defeated. Uh, and he was talking about the, you know, the numbers that, that are jumping. I know in Massachusetts, we had very good news yesterday, zero deaths for the first time in three months. Uh, but in the rest of the country, uh, numbers are, are um, going up. And um, he just said at this point, it's not an instruction, it's a plea. And it looked like he was begging um, for, for people to listen. Uh, and continuing um, the, the point in the conversation um, that I just had with uh, Jennifer, I'm wondering from your perspective, what's the role of social media in all this? Uh, I, as I know that commun as communication scholars, it was much celebrated, especially after the Arab Springs. Everybody was thinking, here it is. It's, it's the force that's going to bring about social change. But I think that the vulnerabilities of social media to the spread of misinformation is now painfully clear. Yeah, yeah I think, um, you know, social media is embedded in a bigger ecosystem. So we kind of like have to first accept that misinformation has always been kind of like a part of kind of like our, our history as humans. Uh, and in that regard, kind of like social media falls into this category that something's changed, but others haven't. Mm -hmm. And uh, so when I think about social media, I would, you know, I, I, I always ask what's new with this. 
And for me, what's new is that obviously it allows people to be on the table and to have their voices heard that haven't been heard before, which in general you, you named Arab Spring, but I would also think of, for example, the Me Too, Me Too movement and Black Lives Matter, mm -hmm. who kind of like use this force for good, right? And for social change and to air grievances and to make their voices heard. At the same time, we also know that social media companies, generally speaking, optimize their platforms and their algorithms based on the engagement. Mm -hmm. And obviously as communication scholars, we know what drives engagement. And that is not positivity, that is not optimism, uh, that is not kind of like that we agree with each other, but rather that is discord and negativity. And so we have a system that is built on basically making money off of our disagreements. And this is of course also where uh, misinformation comes in because misinformation is more scandalous, is more shocking than kind of like the third Washington Post article that kind of like agrees that uh, COVID is a threat and we should act accordingly. Right, um, so we used as an example, and I wonder if you talk about it uh, for just a minute, this movie that was doing the round pandemic and um, the New York Times reported when it came out, it reached within a week, uh, 8 million views. I mean, it surpassed um, Taylor Swift's concert. And I, I mean, I got it through WhatsApp from Israel. Um, how do, and, and it makes an outrageous claims. I mean, one of the scientists there was saying something about the virus uh, the, being activated by the mask or something uh, insane like that. And, and people viewed it. Yeah, I mean, first and foremost, we have to just like, you know, take one step back and also uh, consider the opportunity that people just watch this for entertainment. I think, you know, we've, we've all watched this and, you know, like we don't believe this. So, and, and you know, I think that's kind of like always important when, when thinking about these numbers that, you know, like a lot of people watch this and or Alex Jones, for example, but, but don't just like believe what, what they see. Uh, the second aspect I think is, and this is kind of like, speaks to what I said earlier that, you know, like the avenues of, of communications that we are, that were already in place also pushed pandemic forward. In this case, for example, the QAnon conspiracy theory and kind of like the platforms that, and the groups and the pages that, that peddled this conspiracy theory were also very, very early on active in spreading the pandemic video. Mm -hmm. And, you know, in general, conspiracy theories and the pandemic video certainly is one, um, want to make sense of the world. And in, in, a, in a sense, you know, that's what the video is trying to do, that you can know, you know, like you have someone to blame and you have an explanation for what's going on because uncertainty is much harder and more difficult to handle, especially if a lot of the communication around the coronavirus, for example, around masks was unfortunate. Right. And I was thinking, when I was thinking about the different uh, outrageous claims, I'm, I'm thinking, wow, this is Pizzagate all over again. And now I read that Pizzagate, the very Pizzagate is making a comeback. So I'm wondering if you have a, a suggestion for people, how can we sift truth from fiction? Uh, because it's not as easy as it may look. And even with just this specific example, I got this vi uh, video from a friend with two master's degree, who was a senior, uh, executive at, at the healthcare, uh, one of the biggest healthcare companies in Israel? I think there are two aspects of this. There's the individual aspects, or for example, if you're being, you know, sh shared this content via messengers, that you just like have to talk with people. Like there's no other option than just like discourse, you know, like as we all kind of like contribute to the same society and kind of like uh, yes. want to live with each other. Uh, the second part is kind of like the bigger aspect. And the question is, what are social media companies to do about this? And I think one important aspect in this regard is just that, you know, deplatforming works. And I think we need to uh, ask Facebook, YouTube, Twitter, Instagram, and others to take responsibility and, you know, removing dangerous information from their platform, including, you know, anti-vaccination sentiments or the spread of pandemic. Right, and they've done this with this movie and they, they read it, took out now um, one of the subgroups that was, um, you know, and that, that's a whole other, maybe we can get back to it later. Um, so I want to bring Felice into the conversation. I'm kind of trying to watch my time here. Um, so Felice, considering everything that was just outlined by uh, Jennifer and Jonas, uh, I, I want, I'm wondering what about the coverage of this crisis 
makes your job particularly challenging right now? One of the biggest, one of the most difficult things is the fact that this is a new virus and the, the information we're giving out is changing because the knowledge is changing. And there's so much that's not understood. New things are being learned every day. So it seems like, um, oh, you were lying before you said there's no point in wearing a mask. And now everyone is saying, wear a mask. And that's a really good example of how the changing understanding of the virus changed the public health advice. You know, nothing really changed about the understanding of how masks work. But we came to realize that this is a virus that spreads through the air, and which is unusual, you know, and much more easily than something like flu. So yeah, wearing a mask doesn't protect you that much. And that's what the original advice was. Don't, it's not gonna protect you that much. And we need every mask for healthcare providers. And now it, it, real, it became more of a thing where you have to, people who are asymptomatic, oh, and this is the other big finding that changed everything was realizing the extent to which the virus is being spread by people who don't have symptoms. So suddenly that really changes the equation and you want everybody to wear a mask because you don't know who could potentially spread the virus. So you're not wearing it to protect yourself necessarily. You're wearing it to make establish a social norm where everybody's wearing it so that um, people who happen to be sick without knowing it won't be spreading it as easily. Right. Um, and then the other issue we talked about is, is um, the misinformation that's coming sometimes from the White House uh, and, uh, you know, the president being a vessel for spreading misinformation or exhibiting behavior that contradicts his own experts. I mean, it, going to um, saying we have plenty of testing when we know we don't have plenty of testing, we have PPE, we don't have enough PPE and so and so on. I'm sure it's a big challenge for you. And I wanted to take one specific example and talk about uh, the president's favorite drug, hydroxychloroquine. Um, so it really was, it was kind of a roller coaster with this. Um, use it, don't use it. it. Objectively, the science was not clear on that. And you just uh, published an article about that. Uh, how do you communicate? How do you make sure you communicate this information clearly and fairly without people thinking that you're taking sides? Well, it's uh, really hard to do because people, I mean, even um, my audience at the Boston Globe is actually pretty smart and sophisticated. And um, when I wrote a story about a study on um, hydroxychloroquine, two studies actually, in um, outpatients, the responses I got were, were really surprising. I mean, people thought I was taking sides. I mean, one person said, you're just, uh, you're just like the president, you're raising false hopes. When in fact, the story said, we don't know, <laughs> you know, and, and, and people have a hard time dealing with uncertainty, especially when you're talking about outpatients. Nobody knows uh, whether hydroxychloroquine may be helpful in um, treating or preventing um, COVID-19, but um, there's reason to think it might be. And there's plenty of people who've taken the drug to treat other illnesses without ill effects. So it's not like it's automatically deadly. The drug's been around a long time and has a pretty good safety record. Um, so it, you know, one person who objected to that article said, you know, you didn't do your homework. Um, hydroxychloroquine works only when you take it with zinc and you didn't put that in there. And um, oh. the evidence, the evidence that the person gave me for that was that, well, they're doing a huge clinical trial here in New York. And I wrote back and said, if, if this were a known fact, they wouldn't be doing a trial, you know, and just right. to, to say, we don't know, we're asking questions. Um, it's gonna be a while before we have an answer. It's a really hard thing to communicate. And I actually, in this particular instance, really like the, the headline um, I, don't, I don't know if you suggested it or it was your editor uh, at the Globe, but the headline, and I quote, it said, everyone, including Trump, has an opinion about this potential COVID-19 treatment, and that's making it hard to find out if it works. So I think it was just a beautiful way to bring the discussion to just that fact that the fact that everybody is doing this guessing, jumping into this guessing game is interrupting the scientists. Because right, exactly. The, the story was about how these researchers were having trouble recruiting 
for for their study because people are saying, wait, that's the thing that, that Trump is promoting, so it's it can't be right, you know. Right, and it's still yeah. Uh, so related to this, one of your sources said, um, I think it was a scientist from the University of Washington, uh, and I really like this quote, he said, uh, people don't know what to believe anymore. Uh, when one day you're hearing it's a miracle drug, the next day you're hearing it's unsafe. I think you really put the finger on the heart of the issue because we're as a, at this point, we're so stressed, we're desperate, we're, we're like primed to accept news about a miracle drug. Do you think we are part of the problem? We being the media? They, they, no, the they audience, the consumers, the people, society. Uh, oh, I think it's really hard on consumers. I mean, with, with um, COVID-19, there's two issues. One, the one I mentioned about the science being incomplete and, and we're still learning. The other is that people are getting different messages from different people. And if you go back to the mask thing, you know, the president gets up there on the day that it was officially US policy that people should wear masks. And he goes, well, uh, I'm not going to wear one. Right? So suddenly it becomes a, a political statement whether or not you take this very ordinary public health uh, measure. And, and it's really hard to know. Um, there was a doctor, I, I can't remember who it was, that interviewed on a show I was listening to, who said, well, when you hear two different stories, you pick the one you like. Right, that fits. I was, yeah. I was, and, and you honest, I was going to ask you this question. Do we believe just what affirms our identity? Uh, is that what we're doing here? Is that part of the process? I think confirmation bias plays a role. Uh, I think to a bigger extent, collective identity and basically the media ecology around that plays an important role. So basically if, you know, like we don't only trust one source, but if, you know, like the people that we hang out with talk about the same things and the media outlets that we listen to talk about the same things, uh, then this can reinforce kind of like your already kind of like existing opinion. And at the same time, we try to, you know, silence uh, things that we don't agree with, you know, like we try to avoid dissonance. And what we can kind of like see and um, colleagues at Berkman have shown this in like, in a book that uh, called Network Propaganda and that for the US election 2016, it's kind of like, and Jennifer talked about this as well, that you kind of like have a polarization in the US, right? Yeah. But what my colleagues highlighted was that it's not only a polarization, it's kind of like more an asymmetric polarization. So you kind of like where you would media ecosystem, right? Where you would expect uh, the center right to be, there's no real media outlet anymore that kind of like fills that role. And so you kind of like have the mainstream media and then there's nothing on the right. And then there's kind of like Fox News and then there's Breitbart and then there are other outlets. And that's kind of like the, the push to the right that contributes kind of like to this politicization of, uh, you know, masks, for example, or of a virus that, and it's kind of like also guilty in promoting misinformation at the same time. Yeah. So this, I want to get back to you. Um, something that, that this pandemic exposed is, is really, really many levels of social inequalities, we, uh, especially in the delivery of healthcare, of the healthcare system. And I'm wondering if you think that the topic of socialized medicine, and I know it's a hot button issue uh, in the United States, do you think we will see a dramatic shift just because so many people lost their job? So maybe it will make people question again the notion that your healthcare is attached to your job, that you're afraid to go to the doctor. Yeah, I think it could very well change the discussion about healthcare, which was already happening um, with um, Bernie Sanders and the Medicare for All and the young people being very supportive of that idea. But now when you, if we're gonna have, you know, huge numbers of people unemployed and no way to get health insurance, that's really going to drive home some of the problems with the system. And we're also seeing things like uh, the different prices that people pay just to get a COVID test, you know, ranging from a few hundred dollars to a few thousand dollars for the same thing. That all points up um, some of the real problems with the system. Right, Jennifer, do you have anything to add to that from your perspective? Yeah, you know, that's a question that I think journalists as well as researchers are grappling with. I know that the um, the National Academy of Science is working on some different publications on kind of this issue of communication. Um, so I think like uh, at one level, the challenge here is that things that resonate emotionally, things that 
um, like things that stories that we heard about our brother's friend or our friend or our mother, like those have emotional resonance. And so those anecdotes become our data. And when we're, when we're presented with objective data in a spreadsheet, that's not, that doesn't emotionally resonate with anyone except maybe people who really love data. Um, maybe there are some people on this call who that like, you know, get excited about that, but it's, um, it doesn't, for most people, that's not, doesn't have the same pull. And so the question then is how do we communicate like factual data-based information in a way that resonates emotionally? And so part of that is storytelling. Part of that is thinking about how we do storytelling as a form of research. Um, you know, at RAND where I work, we have communication analysts and I can't tell you how many conversations I have with them when I'm working on a project. Like, how am I going to make this interesting to someone who's not, you know, deep in the data and me, interesting to not me. Um, and, um, and, and the, but then there's a different, at another level where I think the challenge is even greater because it's not just about storytelling. It's about people who fundamentally wa want to reject science. They want to discredit it and they want to discredit it because the facts are inconvenient for them. And the facts may be inconvenient for any number of reasons, because they challenge your identity, because they challenge a religious belief, because they um, mean that you would have to change your lifestyle, or because they have economic consequences, or, or they're politically unpalpable. So there's a whole rate, so, th so there's people who, who would turn to data if they had that, re that emotional pull. And then there are people who are rejecting science for um, knowing, knowingly, rejecting it because it's inconvenient. And I think that is a much harder challenge to tackle. Yeah, I agree. Um, so I have a few more questions, but I think that uh, we have a producer, uh, Arjun Singh with us, who's going to take the conversation over and, and bring our students into the conversation and some questions from the audience. So we can get back to it. I have one more question that I want to ask maybe at the end, Arjun. Thank you very much, Shoshana, for the nice introduction. As she said, my name is Arjun Singh. I'm a producer over at WGBH. Uh, for this section, first we will be leading off with four students from the class who have their own questions. Then we'll be opening it up to the audience for a question and answer period. But while they're getting ready, Jonas, let's kick off this section with a question for you. When Reddit and social media first came about, and particularly uh, the internet became more widespread, some people had the notion that this would be the free market of ideas and that you didn't necessarily need to protect the information that was on the internet or monitor it because eventually the right idea with facts and information would come up. Unfortunately, one of the things that we do see is that money talks on the internet the same way that money can talk in real life. How has money impacted the way that misinformation has spread on social media networks? And do you think that it was somewhat of a naive notion to think that this could have been a free market of information that worked out to positive benefit? I, th I think there are two, two answers to that. So I think in general, like the idea of a free market of ideas on the internet is, I, th I think, you know, it's, it's nice in theory. I also think it undercuts what we know is happening. That is, there are power imbalances. People are being oppressed. Uh, others are have kind of like have the favor, have more power in, you know, who can talk, who is allowed to talk, in what ways can they talk. And this is also reproduced online. So, you know, like there was, like we've never had a free market of idea offline. We never had a free market of ideas online. Like who was, who were the first people that were online, right? It was mostly like, white people from kind of like the US and uh, Europe and kind of like they put like a stamp on how the internet looks like. And uh, similarly, if you kind of like look at the social media companies, kind of like, you know, who created that and with what, what is kind of like the goal of those. And in general, it's always, you know, making money and you know, making money always kind of like is based around the idea of what keeps people on our site. And as I said earlier, a, a big aspect to this is, yes, connecting people, but also, you know, people, keeping people engaged by showing them negative content, meaning that they don't, don't agree with, that is scandalizing. Uh, for, and that can be conspiracy theories, that can be disinformation. And this can contribute to kind of like, you know, like a polarization online. And also, obviously, kind of like we have to consider that, you know, who's actually wants to talk, who wants to find their own people online, that is usually not the people that are actually represented by the mainstream media, by kind of like the newspapers and by the cable news. 
Great. And so next we'll be turning over to our first student. Megan Donahue is a psychology major here at Suffolk. She's a rising junior. Megan, welcome. Thank you. Uh, so my question is twofold and it covers the work of both Dr. Kaiser and Dr. Kavanaugh. Um, social media platforms like Facebook and Twitter have been hesitant to fact check or interfere with false statements made by President Trump, including those about COVID-19. What effect do you think this has had on the overall polarization of social media and the reinforcement of ideological bubbles? And along with that, what can we as media consumers do to combat truth decay? So I think that the, the things that the, the, the trends that we've seen around disinformation, whether it's President Trump or any other political figure or um, uh, media figure around disinformation are just another example of what we've been observing for um, some period of time now, which is um, social media companies being very hands off in terms of labeling um, information that's blatantly false, especially if they feel like it's in the public interest. Um, and I think that over time, they've taken various steps to try to do more fact checking uh, and to uh, try to think about how they can combat this challenge of disinformation online. Um, but I think that they have, um, it makes them uncomfortable. I know from talking to people who work at social media companies that they're very afraid of being seen as um, arbiters of truth. Um, they don't want to be in that role. At the same time, um, I think that there's a growing um, recognition that, uh, you know, there has to be some kind of governance of these platforms if we want to keep them um, as free public spaces where we're able to have exchange of accurate information, um, especially when we're talking about things like COVID-19 where disinformation can be so dangerous. And I think that's why this issue has really risen to the top of people's priority lists around COVID because in this situation, false information about uh, treatments, um, how it spreads, this stuff can be the ma a matter of life or death. And so the, the, the tension and the attention to it is heightened because uh, of the consequences are so severe. Um, I think the politi politicization of social media the, um, and the ways in which issues seem to you know, go viral and, and then spin into these two very different stories on the left and the right is something that we've seen time and time again um, on these platforms. And I think they're kind of built for this as Yona said, like, you know, the things that sell, the things that spread are not the, the happy, positive stories. They're the negative ones, the ones that spread outrage. In terms of how uh, consumers can tackle uh, truth decay or um, avoid falling prey to it, I think the things I usually talk about are thinking about, mul like thinking about multiple sources. Um, I never look at one source for information. I'm always looking to confirm it somewhere else. Um, and I want to get many different perspectives, including ones that I might disagree with. And that gives me a full view of a given issue and helps me to weed out the false information. The second is to think about sourcing. When you're reading an article, when you're looking at um, uh, something that you see on Twitter or on Facebook, who's being cited? Um, and do you consider the person being cited to be an expert in that topic? When I'm looking for information on COVID-19, I really am interested in looking for information from doctors and epidemiologists and people who are doing the research and have firsthand knowledge of these things. If I wanna know about economic consequences, I wanna look for economists, but I'm less interested in hearing about epidemiological information from economists. I, you know, I wanna get as close to the firsthand as I can. And I think those are two things that um, you, media consumers can do to help uh, protect themselves or make themselves more resilient to disinformation and truth decay. Jonas, was there anything you wanted to add to that? No, everything that Jennifer said. Great, and let's move on to our next student. Greta Jacobson is an interior design major coming to us from Middleborough, Massachusetts. Greta, welcome. Thank you, Arjun. Um, my question is, in a research report conducted by the National Bureau of Economic Research, it is stated that between 11.9 to 25.7% of people have been non-compliant with the stay at home and social distancing orders due to the downplay of the virus addressed by Fox News. Media plays a major role in how people perceive the virus, and it's understandable that freedom of expression is important. However, with health security being at the forefront right now, do you believe that there should be limits towards the media? And should the CDC report on the virus instead of news hosts to help depoliticize the issue? Uh, to what extent might this help in monitoring the pandemic within the US? Felice, let's go with you to hear if you have anything to say on that question. That's a really tough one, you know, working for an outlet that I think is pretty responsible. It's really hard for me to know what we can do about misinformation. Um, and 
I, I don't think you're ever going to find um, the mainstream media recommending censorship or saying Fox News shouldn't be saying that. So what can we do? What you were saying about the CDC, I think is a very, very good point. Um, it, it was really unfortunate the way they, the CDC was essentially silenced um, right after the beginning of the epidemic, after somebody got on a call and said, you know, this is going to be bad and I'm talking to my children about it. And then suddenly everything shut down and there were no more CDC briefings. And it was, it's really um, the best way to get the public to pay attention is to have trusted medical professionals leading the way and for the politicians to step aside and let the experts speak. And I think if you had more of that kind of tape instead of, of uh, the politicians, and I'm talking about governors as, as well as president, if you had more of that kind of um, speech out there, it would show up even on Fox News, because that's where the that's you know where the information would be. The other question that I, that I think a lot of people um, find troubling and difficult is uh, when they were doing those daily briefings and the president was getting up there saying things that are untrue over and over again. Um, there were calls to, to just stop covering it and just, you know, watch it and then uh, bet what he said and report the actual truth instead of just what he said. And, uh, but some people argued in, uh, against that saying, look, he's the president. Um, people need to understand who he is and what, what he has to say and make their own judgments. So I don't, I don't know which side I'm on with that. I think it was a really, really problematic situation. And there's only so much you can do with fact checking. Once the statement has been made and it's out there and it's being repeated, the fact checkers are, are just, you know, running behind you in, in your dust, you know? So you, you raise a really good issue and I, I don't have an easy answer. Police, on sort of that same note, do you think that, you know, in the competitive atmosphere of newspapers, you're at the Globe, you're also competing with the Times, the LA Times as well, with this competitive atmosphere and there's a rush to want to present the most breaking news information, when we're talking about something like the coronavirus where people are publishing things before they're peer reviewed, looking at uh, certain websites, um, studies that have yet to be vetted by the community, is there a danger of information coming out that hasn't been vetted that may have to be retracted or similar to what we saw happen with uh, the controversy with the Lancet a few weeks ago? Is that something that concerns you within the media landscape right now? Yes, it's, it's very tricky. And again, there isn't an easy answer. There has been a rush to uh, report publications that are just what they call preprints. They haven't been vetted but they have potentially interesting information, so they get thrown up on a website. But the problem is this whole process of peer review and publicating, publicate, publishing stories is, takes too long. And we, we, we need to respond to the pandemic and we need the most up-to-date information. And it's, it is very tricky because no matter how many times you say this hasn't been vetted, this may not be true, and you use all these qualifiers, that's not what, what people remember. It isn't um, a competitive um, issue so much as a real hunger to get the information out as quickly as possible because we're in a fast-moving situation. Mm -hmm. And let's move on to our next student's uh, questionnaire, which is Suchi Patel. She's an incoming freshman over from Lowell, and she's planning on majoring in international relations. Suchi, welcome. Thank you, Arjun. So my question is to Felice. So COVID-19 has definitely been a test of faith in both the government and news outlets of many countries around the world. Through your experience in writing for the Providence Journal and Boston Globe, what techniques do you think garner the most respect and trust of your readers? And how do you believe formal media should respond to increasing skepticism during a pandemic? Okay, I think people, people respond to information that is um, presented in a straightforward way that is clearly not opinionated and that is very well backed up. You know, now, now that everything's online, you, you link to a study, you refer to a study, include the link. You know, explain where you get your information um, and qualify the information. This is very good. This is still, you know, something that's developing. I think people do respond to that. And what was the second half of your question? It's, how do you believe formal media should respond to increasing skepticism during a pandemic? 
Okay, yeah, that goes back to the, the whole question that we're dealing with. What can we do to respond to it? The only thing I can think of is that we can do our best to really tell the best story in the clearest and most truthful way. And we can have a, rule, a role in um, fact checking um, some of the, the uh, misinformation that's out there, addressing it and, and trying to correct it. Um, but how I, t how I get somebody to look, you should be reading the Boston Globe and not Breitbart. I mean, how, how do I even reach these people? I don't know. I would like someone else <laughs> to, to tell me what, what we can do in the mainstream media to deal with this problem. Great. But maybe, Arjun, if I can add something, maybe, Felice, on that note, what can people do to support uh, good journalism? Oh, buy a subscription. I mean, it's, it, it comes down to, to money. I mean, uh, you, you don't get good journalism isn't done by volunteers. Mm -hmm. So it, it's, it's a costly, costly thing to do um, because it's um, people intensive. So uh, if you want to support us, then you need to subscribe to as many different uh, mainstream publications as you can afford to do. And, you know, read them and tell your friends about them. Great, and I want to move on to our next uh, student speaker right now, and she's Livia Costa. She's an incoming freshman who plans on studying global business and economics. She's coming to us from Hudson, Massachusetts. Livia, welcome. Hi, uh, my question is for Dr. Kaiser. You recently retweeted a tweet from Joan Donovan discussing case studies which describe how COVID-19 misinformation circulates in Black communities. Do you believe that the Black community has been directly targeted or has suffered disproportionately due to the COVID-19 pandemic due to a false, a set of false information? And if so, what do you believe causes the specific susceptibility and increased rate of the spread of misinformation? Okay, thank you. Putting on, getting put onto the spot for a retweet. Um, no, that's not, that's a great question. And I think, you know, like, I think what John Donovan uh, kind of like talked about was a report by Brenda Collins Dexter, uh, who's at uh, Call of Her Change and, I think a current fellow at the Schoenstein Center. And, you know, like, I, I think I'm, I have to flag this. I'm, you know, I'm not an expert in the context of, of misinformation and, and race. And I think it's important to note that, misin but it's important to note that misinformation and especially the history of misinformation cannot be thought without race. Uh, since kind of like, you know, like all the racist notion, notions are inherently disinformation. And, and so this is kind of like the first thing that we have to keep in mind when, when thinking about these things and how disinformation was always used for oppression and um, contributed to kind of like our understanding of systemic racism that is still kind of like very inherent to, to science as we know it. Um, you know, I, I can't speak to kind of like who promoted this uh, mis and disinformation, but I, you know, would always recommend reading the report and kind of like highlighting the different kind of like themes uh, that Brenda Collins Dexter highlighted in her report. And I, th I think something that was said at the start of this panel kind of like reminded me of this report actually, because um, there are inherent, you know, there's an inherent mistrust of institutions in, in parts of the African American community you know, and rightfully so, because a lot of these institutions are inherently racist. And I think in fighting this, we kind of like need to acknowledge the inherent racism in some of these institutions, especially in their history, and have to think about how to dismantle that. Because I think like, you know, as long as institutions are not dealing with their own histories and kind of like the pain that they've caused I think it's hard going forward and creating trust, which is kind of like necessary as we've kind of like agreed on. And our last question for the student section is coming from Shannon Kelleher. She's coming to us from North Reading as a psychology major. Shannon, welcome. Hi, thank you. My question is for Jennifer. Your biography mentions that you have focused on the integration of women into positions previously unavailable to them. When it comes to the medical field, women in the past have faced prejudiced actions that kept them from obtaining high positions in the field. Since then, many women have been able to obtain high positions and therefore attempt to inform the public on the health crisis. Under the administration of Trump, 
a constant, a consistent message of exclusion to women, race, and science has been implicit and explicit in several policies. In your opinion, how does the position of exclusion affect dealing with the COVID-19 and other crises and policies in the past few years? That's a great question. So just as a little background, my work that focuses on gender focuses mostly on the integration of women into the military, into positions that have been close to them. And so, you know, in the past decade, there's been an incredible change um, in terms of women being now allowed to serve in basically any combat position um, that is open to men, um, if they can meet the criteria. So I don't have specific expertise on the medical field, but I can talk more generally, I think, about the ways in which um, disinformation and, um, the, and micro-targeting and messages that target specific communities and leave out other communities. And I think this builds on what Jonas was talking about, the ways in which that exacerbates, um, exacerbates the consequences of the pandemic. Um, I think that one of the things that the internet and social media has done is made it so that um, it's very easy for people, actors, to target their disinformation at those who are most susceptible to them. Um, and so that can mean targeting disinformation at women, it can mean targeting disinformation at um, minorities, it can mean targeting disinformation at kind of any sort of group. Um, and, and to the extent that that disinformation then leads to um, differential access to uh, accurate information to healthcare, to, um, uh, to the information that people need to make the decisions that are required to protect themselves um, and to um, take the steps needed to protect their families, um, to make economic decisions that are smart in a period of really severe economic um, downturn and depression, um, then, then disinformation becomes um, something that exacerbates and makes inequality worse. Um, and so I think that's why disinformation is, um, is inherently dangerous, even when it's not talking about something like COVID-19, um, because it fundamentally undermines um, individuals' ability to make smart decisions for their lives. And so it becomes something that really can be almost crippling in that sense, um, whether you're talking about an individual or a policymaker who then can't make um, good policy decisions. Great. Well, thank you to all of our students, Megan, Greta, Suchi, Livia, and Shannon for participating and asking some really phenomenal questions. Now we're going to move on to the question and answer where we're going to field questions over from the audience. So Jennifer, why don't we stick with you? And this first question is really in relation to how the U.S. government can build trust. Right now, we're seeing a lot of distrust in the government, whether that's distrust of governors or the president himself. What are some steps that the U.S. government can take in order to regain the trust or build more trust among their population, particularly when it comes to issuing these public health ordinances? Well, I think I, I, I think this is a really tough question. And like I said before, I don't have a good answer to how we rebuild trust because, you know, build, rebuilding trust takes a long time. And I think rebuilding trust at the local level is a lot easier than at the federal level, because at the local level, you can imagine interacting more with your local representatives and having more transparency and access to government, um, maybe shifting who's providing that message. Like maybe the right messenger isn't the representative. It's, it's a doctor or it's somebody in your, in your community who can provide you that um, information that resonates with you that you find trustworthy. Um, at the federal level, that's harder because the, the federal government is naturally kind of removed from us. But I think you could think about some of the same sorts of steps. So things that have rebuilt trust in government in the past um, have been efforts to increase transparency. Um, trust in the government was really low in the 1970s. And a lot of the reforms made to increase transparency, especially around the collection of intelligence, um, helped to rebuild some trust in government because people felt like they were seeing what's going on. They felt like people were being held accountable, like they were able to um, have some assurances that the government was acting in their interests. And so you could think about um, some of those same steps now, um, increasing transparency, providing more information, making sure that the information provided um, comes back up with data that is provided by experts um, rather than by someone who's one step or two steps or 10 steps removed from that expert. Um, and then, but I mean, part of rebuilding trust also falls on the individuals. Um, you know, if, 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 if I say that I don't trust government and I don't even trust my representatives, um, there's something really easy that I can do about that. And that's vote for somebody that I do trust. Um, you know, there's, um, 
there is a, a proactive element here, which comes right down to a lot of the discussion that we're having now about the upcoming elections, is that one way that we can rebuild trust in government is not from the top down, but from the bottom up thinking about who we elect and making decisions based on who do I trust to take my interests in their hands rather than who plays for my team or um, you know, uh, who is my brother voting for. Um, so I think that those are some ideas. It's a question that we're actively looking at at RAND. We have a, a report that we're hopefully will come out later this year thinking, um, looking specifically at some of these building blocks of, of trustworthiness. Um, uh, what what specific attributes of institutions do people tr have trouble with or find as the source of their distrust? And then once, identif once we identify those, we may be able to say something about how to turn it around. Shoshana, I'd, I'd like to sort of ask you on, um, oh, I'm sorry, did you want to say I wanted to add something to that because I've been thinking a lot. We'll go next to <laughs> Yeah, I, I've been thinking a lot about that because uh, I, I teach about conflicts and I, I think about it from an individual perspective. What do you do when you, you know, distrust your partner? How do you rebuild this? And it's pretty much the same for, um, for communities and, and states on the more macro level. And, and I'm thinking that it would be good, especially in a situation like that, to add a little humility uh, when presenting information on behalf of, of experts. And I remember watching at the beginning of this an interview with a, I forgot his name, the South Korean Fauci, their, uh, uh, their expert, and it was filtered, you know, it was trans subtitled. Uh, and when he was asked at the end of the interview, what have you learned from this? And this is somebody who's been in this job for 30 years. Uh, he said that we need to be humble. Um, that we don't know everything. And I think this is, again, it's about how you communicate that fact to people. And if you communicate it in this way, they will be more forgiven if you didn't, you know, if you had to, something had to change, something, you know, changed in the information. So I think to all of us, if we could add that. Well, and Shoshana, just on a quick follow-up, you know, that was very specific to the U.S. government, but you've also studied very closely media, and particularly in the Israeli government. I know Israel is a smaller country, but they too have had issues of having to justify certain things that can be controversial. Is the level of distrust in the public in Israel comparable to what we see in the United States? If the Netanyahu government, for say... Yeah you know, said everybody needs to wear a mask, is there gonna be a significant rejection of that or does that seem unique to the US right now? I think it depends who you ask. Uh, so from a medical perspective, when people got this instruction at the very beginning to stay home and put masks, they did that. I mean, they did struggle. Again, Israel population is multi-layered and there were some pockets with issues, but Israel took very aggressive measures and when in a specifically small ultra-Orthodox community, they saw a lot of high numbers, um, basically the army came in. So the equivalent of, of uh, marshals uh, and, and locked people at home. So I don't know that I'm an advocate for doing something like that, uh, but people listened. I think that just generally as a question and the country handled it much, much, much better. I think if you want to compare it to Massachusetts, it's about the same population. Israel only had about 300 and some uh, deaths, where in Massachusetts we surpassed 8,000. So in the bottom line of handling this, uh, it worked, but they're battling now another, uh, and I think what were they seeing now is not so much distrust as just fatigue. People are just sick of this. And that may be kind of a strong urge um, that's making them, you know, not watch as much the distance and, and so on, but they're bringing back some measures. Jonas, I'd like to direct the next question over to you. And this question is what safety precautions from a dangerous virus should social media post to the public, so social media take to keep the public safe from bad information, but let me amend that a little too to say that we've seen what Twitter has done. We're seeing what Facebook's trying to do. Have the measures put in place against bad information been effective? Uh, obviously, kind of like without having extensively studied, uh, we, we can't possibly know that. Like the platforms do know that. Uh, what I will say is kind of like on the one hand, you know, like the, the platforms have my sympathy because there's no right answer to this. Kind of like at one point, every platform has to draw the line of what they allow and what they don't allow. And, and making this, 
or drawing this line will always be controversial and they'll get critique from both sides of kind of like, you know, like saying this is kind of like too strict or this is kind of like too less fair. Uh, with that having said, the platforms have kind of like allowed for communities to, to grow and, you know, uh, and disinformation to have been shared on Facebook, YouTube, Twitter, and other social media platforms for years, right? And now we're kind of like talking about this and they're doing slow steps to counter this. Uh, whereas, you know, like health experts have kind of like asked for years kind of like to, to do something about anti-vaccination, for example. Uh, and similar kind of like experts have said for years to do something about white nationalist groups. Uh, and, you know, like now something is happening, but it's kind of like happening uh, way too late. On this question, um, this is uh, applicable to all of you, but Jennifer, let's start with you. What do you think about the idea that disinformation should be looked at as a systemic issue rather than necessarily a naturally occurring phenomenon? And should it be studied as a systemic problem? I think that there's probably, um, it has both um, attributes. I think that there is a piece of this that is systemic. Um, that's how we describe truth decay as a system. And we, like, we think that it is a systemic problem because it kind of feeds itself. Um, you know, as, as this information spreads, um, it creates these alternative narratives in these different communities. Um, those communities become increasingly polarized because they believe different things, which causes disinformation to spread, right? So it's like a cyclical thing that feeds itself. However, there's also a piece of this that is not cyclical in the sense that um, the problem can be exacerbated by external actors who have who see advantages to spreading disinformation. Um, so we talked a little bit about people who uh, intentionally undermine science. You can also think about the role that um, uh, political actors or foreign actors or businesses who have an interest in having you believe something other than what's what the truth is. Um, and so they're feeding that information into the system. And so, you know, that then is, um, the, you know, they, they, have a, they have their hand in that. So it's not, it's not just, um, it's not just a, a cycle. It's not just a system. It ha it's being fed um, by these external actors who are, are making it worse. And so I think understanding truth decay as something that has both this, um, this self-feeding aspect as well as um, this aspect that's driven by um, the fundamental nature of um, economics um, in our country and in our, in our world, the, the nature of the media landscape, um, competition between countries, the, the nature of, of political spheres and political parties, all those things make it worse. And so I think it has both attributes and exists somewhere in the middle. Um, that's certainly the approach we've taken with the Truth Decay Project. And I think thinking about it that way is important because systemic problems are even harder to tackle because they're kind of baked in. Um, yeah, and Jonas, what, what about you? Yes, no, no, I j just want to uh, follow up on Jennifer's points because I think all of those were like totally on point. And I, you know, I wanted to raise kind of like the aspect of misinformation as function or disinformation as function. And from a systemic view, misinformation slash disinformation has kind of like the function in the sense of it can contribute contribute to the formation of a collective identity. That is kind of like, you know, like we get our information from all different kind of aspects and that's kind of like what our worldview can then kind of like consists of. And misinformation can help keep this worldview alive. You know, even though it's not true. Think for example about white nationalists, right? Like their world, worldview is extremely built on misinformation because otherwise it would kind of like collapse. Uh, at the same time, misinformation and disinformation can be used against targeted groups, especially vulnerable groups, minorities, um, to Olivia's point too, uh, are, are targets of misinformation. If you think, for example, of the, the 2016 election. And so I think, you know, like, thinking not only about misinformation kind of like on, you know, like on the systemic level, but also like from a function perspective can be a fruitful in this regard. Well, that was fantastic. And I want to say thank you to all of our panelists for participating. Thank you for allowing me to moderate this. I'm going to turn it over back to Shoshana. There's one final question for our panelists. But once again, thank you everybody for participating. Thank you to the audience for coming in. I hope to see you all next time we do this. Yes, yeah, so I want to thank you, Arjun. I want to end with one question. I know we kind of touched a little bit on the issue of race. Um, 
And I, I just want to end with this. Uh, this, this crisis is clearly multi-layered and uh, it exposed something that was bubbling for a long time uh, underneath the surface. And, and I want to read you a quote um, from a, an interview with John Stewart from just last week and get your take on it. He said, uh, it's like in this moment of more quiet reflection, America suddenly stopped and smelled the racism. And I'm wondering if just sh uh, in short, from your different perspective, how do you read this moment? Um, it has laid bare as never before how our entire um, healthcare system disadvantages um, minorities, particularly black people. And the data is absolutely stunning on how disproportionately hard the black community was hit by COVID. And so once you see that, once you look at those numbers, you can't not start asking the questions, why? And it's a really complex answer, but at the very bottom of it, as you dig down, it always comes down to issues of racism and the, the racism that put people in, in circumstances where they, where they have to go to work and, and are exposed that way. They're living uh, in dense, you know, crowded apartments where they can't isolate themselves, or they have very good reason to not trust the healthcare system, so they're going to be delayed in seeking care, or they're not treated that well. Anyway, they go in seeking care, but their concerns are more readily dismissed than those of white people, and there's more to it than that. It's really complex, but it's really deep and really pervasive, and I think COVID-19, like nothing else, has shown a light on that, and we can't we can't ignore it anymore. Um, Jonas, do you want to add something to that? Sure. I think the the biggest uh, mis or disinformation that I've that I've seen so far in the context of the COVID crisis is kind of like the statement, and I've seen this internationally as well, that coronavirus is the great equalizer, because <laughs> if we're seeing anything that it's not the case. Like I see this, for example, in Europe, more specifically in Germany, where we can see it's a class thing and that people who receive unemployment are much, much more vulnerable to the coronavirus than uh, people who don't. And obviously we see this in the US uh, where the cracks are being made obvious and the coronavirus is, is at the same time a discourse about systemic racism. And, you know, I think we should all contribute really hard to kind of like making this place a more anti-racist environment, really. Because, you know, like if we see statements like the coronavirus is the great equalizer, we should really stand up and yell no. Right. Yeah, I agree. Jennifer? You know, one of the pieces of truth decay is this idea of polarization and the way polarization contributes to the spread of of, of false information and disinformation. And I think a lot of times when we talk about polarization, at least in the US, the first thing we think about is political polarization, red versus blue. Um, and really that's not what we mean when we talk about it. Polarization exists on many levels. It exists um, at economic levels, it exists at like, social levels, um, and it exists in terms of, um, of racial groups. And I think that, that this um, crisis has really underscored the extent to which um, these divides are they, they're not cross-cutting in the sense that they mix people up. They are really um, reinforcing in the sense that they create these um, communities that share a lot of characteristics in terms of their economic status, the jobs they hold, where they live, the things that they are exposed to, um, the challenges that they face, the churches that they go to. And so we've seen that these communities have, you know, this contributes to the spread of these alternative narratives, but it also creates pockets of real vulnerability. Um, vulnerability to a whole range of sorts, whether it's um, a police brutality, whether it's um, uh, the ravages of economic depression, or whether it's COVID. Um, and I think that bridging these divides and thinking about how we create a more integrated community um, in, in which people are mixing on a whole range of different factors, race being one of the primary ones that we need to break down and um, and probably one that if we were able to break that down, the other ones would probably crumble too because so many of them are tied together. And so I think it just really under, underscores the danger of polarization, that it's not just this political concept of red versus blue, that it's a much more fundamental 
um, and pervasive problem um, internationally, but especially in the US, that really corrodes our ability to have a unified country and to make progress forward on key issues. Right, and our interconnectedness. Um, so uh, I think we are, uh, we are done with our, we're out of time. Uh, I want to thank all of our panelists, Jennifer, Jonas, Felice, thank you Arjun, thanks to the students. Thank you for your generosity with your time and thank you for sharing um, your knowledge with us. Um, and back to you, Christina. This was a fascinating look into a really, really complex topic. And um, I can tell you that at many points, I really wanted to jump in myself, but the producers didn't let me. And I wish that the conversation can go on. And I want to thank the students, first of all, who are taking the class for allowing the general public into their classrooms. That is, I think, a really amazing thing that we're able to do here. And I hope that everyone is walking away with more questions than answers, particularly with respect to what they can do themselves about their own media consumption and uh, belief or disbelief in the information that they're consuming. And I'd also like to invite everyone back next week when we will have Congressman Jim McGovern, who is currently chair of the House Rules Committee, who will be in a conversation about um, the impact of COVID on legislating, campaigning, and representing remotely. So I hope to see you all back then. Thank you.